welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everyone, this is Elise Hallett here at the Healthcare Symposium. Uh, I am here with Tara Cohen, who is a human factors research scientist and assistant professor of surgery at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Welcome, Tara. Thank you, Elise. Uh, it's good to have you on the show. I'm so excited. I just started listening to the show, so Which, I'm new to it. That's awesome. About a month ago, yeah, right? Yeah, about a month ago. <laughs> so um, I'm excited to be on the show now. Which is well, great. perfect. You can hear your voice and everything. So it won't happen, <laughs> but other people can. <laughs> Um, so, Tara, what brings you to the Healthcare Symposium this year? This year, I got to have the honor of being a track chair for the Healthcare Environments track or Hospital Environments track, and I also am doing two presentations. So, I'm talking and running some stuff, which is exciting. It sounds busy. Yeah, a little busy. So, the Hospital Environments track, can you speak a little bit about what that focuses on and how it's you know, is set apart from some of the other tracks here? Yeah, sure. So the hospital environments track really focuses on looking at embedded HF researchers in different areas to see, um, mainly in in healthcare or hospital environments, to really understand what approaches they're using in their hospitals and institutions and see how we can learn from human factors in in those clinical environments. So interesting. So you, you mentioned embedded researchers within these these hospital environments. So what does that mean exactly? So that means that if you typically went to school and got a degree in human factors or IO psychology or industrial engineering and you are actually physically located in a healthcare system. So whether that be a hospital or an outpatient setting, you are physically located at that organization and you do research or other work. You can be a practitioner as well, but really focusing on applying human factors research to um, that setting. And so that's kind of a unique position, right? Because most of the times you talk about human factors and will work as maybe a consultant. So getting that like outside perspective in, but kind of being on the edge of it. But here it's really being embedded within these these. Um, healthcare systems, these hospitals, and kind of immersed in the, the day-to-day. Absolutely. It's it's a never-ending job. You know, you're working, in, in my position, I work with the surgeons, so um, I'm up when they're up. I go to sleep when they go to sleep. I'm, you know, in the operating room at 6 a.m. sometimes, and sometimes I'm there late with the residents. So you really have to truly embed yourself, not just theoretically. You're, you're physically embedding yourself in these environments. It sounds like it, getting used to their schedule and yep. their day-to-day rhythm. and um, It sounds exciting, though. It's a lot of fun. It's probably the most fun I've had at a job, although it is my first job. So um, it's, it's a great first experience outside of grad school. So what brought you to this point? So my background is a little weird and bizarre uh, to how I got into this. I actually started... Um, private pilot's license lessons when I was 11. So I started learning to fly when I was really little and thought that I was going to do aviation for my life. Um, And then I went to USC for college and I started studying psychology. And so I was kind of stuck with, man, I really like psychology. I have this passion for aviation. I have no idea what to do. And uh, I reached out to my flight instructor at the time who worked for the Federal Aviation Administration and she said, there's a field called human factors. Come do an internship with us and see if you like it. So I got to work with her and do flight tests um, and I was a human factors intern for the FAA. So we got to recreate accident scenarios. I got to learn about how they define rules and regulations and I had a blast. And so I was like determined to do human factors research in aviation. So I applied to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University because, you know, that makes sense. Um, and I wanted to work with Scott Chappelle at the time. And I had read, you know, his work that he had done in aviation. I was like, this is the perfect match for me. And I got to Riddle and Scott said, you know, aviation's great. There's a lot of great work that can be done there, but I'm starting to apply my methods in healthcare. So if you want to work with me, you're going to work in healthcare. And I said, Okay, so <laughs> I um, started to work in healthcare and then I did an internship with Susan Hallback at Mayo Clinic and that totally solidified my decision to do healthcare research. So 
Um, kind of a weird journey getting. Yes and no. I feel like a lot of people that I've talked to kind of start off with, you know, kind of the aviation side. I mean, given the history of it with human factors and how it's really been grounded there, right? it, it makes sense. I think so. But it, a lot of people are like, how did you, what is the school you went to? Why are you in a hospital? <laughs> they don't understand, but I'm glad someone does. So, so what about your your work then like really solidified like yes healthcare is how I want to apply human factors I think I just really had a good time solving problems and trying to solve problems and I love the multidisciplinary aspect of it I always appreciated getting a new perspective from different people I just thought it helped me learn and grow and and a lot of what human factors is in my opinion is really understanding kind of all the different elements in the system, of course, but that includes the different people who are in that system and really learning about, you know, in, in healthcare, treating one patient could be 20 different people who in, interact with that patient, whether the patient knows it or not. And so I was really kind of touched and inspired by all the people who are interacting and thinking that we could have some sort of, you know, force in, in making that process more effective and safer. So. Yeah, well, it's no easy problem, that's for sure. No, that is definitely for sure. So how are you applying that experience to your work currently at Cedar sinai I really just try to approach every problem by starting off and asking myself who could potentially be involved with this process. And I really strive to build multidisciplinary teams. So on any project, I make sure, you know, if nursing is involved, let's make sure we get a nurse on the team. If there's physicians involved, let's make sure there's an anesthesiologist and a surgeon on the team. Um, and if they can't physically be on the team, because most of these people are incredibly busy, mm -hmm. I try to at least go to where they are and, and interview and, and understand, you know, how does this impact you? If these changes are going to be made, will that impact you positively or negatively? And mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on what we could do to fix this systemic issue? So really identifying all the key players involved in the problem that you're yes. looking at, making sure that they're involved in right. you know, the process and getting information from exactly. them. Exactly, exactly. So what are some of the um, projects and, and things that you're working on? There are so many different projects. Um, one that's kind of taking a lot of my time right now is looking at operating room efficiency, mm -hmm. mainly focusing on operating room turnover, which is one of those projects that really takes into consideration all the perspectives of the individuals in the room. Um, you know, you've got surgeons who want to turn over the rooms as quickly as possible, hoping that they might get another case added to the schedule. And then you've got other staff who aren't incentivized to turn over the room as quickly, which kind of creates some interesting challenges and dynamics and makes it really challenging to try to make this an efficient process. So um, that project's really fun, but really, really challenging and trying to get all the right people on board. Um, and, and I got looped into it because it was a surgeon-led project. So a surgeon I work with really frequently said, hey, I want your help on this project. And then we started looping in more and more people. And now there's almost like a task force really aimed at <laughs> reducing operating room turnover time at the institution. But um, yeah, so that's, that's a fun one. And so for the audience of the podcast, yes. um, when you say operating room turnover, what are you referring to? Great question. Let me explain that for anyone who doesn't know. Um, so between the time that a patient is kind of wheeled into the operating room and the time they come out is the typical length of time they're in the procedure. But oftentimes in healthcare, especially in very busy hospitals, there's multiple procedures that occur in one day. So the time between patient one leaving the room and patient two coming into that room is the operating room turnover time. So during this time, you're cleaning up from patient one, making sure everything's clean, all the equipment is taken out that was used and not needed, and you're preparing the room for patient two. So that means instruments set up, it means bed set up, um, making sure that everything's up and running so when the patient gets in there, they're ready to go. And it's been a very wide initiative across many hospitals in the United States to kind of get that time down to increase productivity. Right, so. you can meet with more patients. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's it's interesting because, you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, focusing on the user, increasing patient safety, but here it's really taken out of that patient context yeah. and really looking at, you know, 
not just when the patient's there, but really that whole process of when the operating room's being used. Absolutely. And it in turn impacts, you know, surgeon satisfaction, which can play a role in how surgeons interact with their patients and interact with their colleagues. And so it's this huge systemic kind of process that that can like cascade into other areas. So And it sounds especially complex, too, if people are getting different incentives. So some people really want to get back quick and others don't. Exactly. And everyone wants to be heard. And, you know, we're trying to involve everyone that we can. And um, that's a challenging part of this work as well, is you want to get the feedback from individuals on the front line. But when you make changes that don't take into consideration their individual comments and thoughts, you sometimes can get kind of that pushback from them later on because they feel like they weren't heard even though you took the time to talk to them. So we really have to kind of play this delicate game of making sure that we really involve the people who we can hopefully make things change for and and, and discuss that with the people that we couldn't make those changes for. Yeah, I was just going to ask, I mean, how do you kind of bridge that um, that gap if they're not seeing their their recommendations implemented? It's, it's been challenging. Um, We try to hold a lot of nursing in-services, which are essentially meetings that happen really early in the morning before the first shift would start. So in-services at our institution typically happen around 6.30 in the morning um, on Wednesdays for for the nurses. There's like a, not always the in-service at that time, but they usually have a a huddle or a meeting. So we we can kind of go in and chat with the whole staff at that point and say, this is what we're trying to do. We value your input. We know that not everything's going to be implemented, but you know we really want you to come to us and let us know if there's blaring things that need to be changed or fixed. So, so just kind of setting the stage up front to manage those expectations. Right. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Ho- hopefully. <laughs> we'll try. Um, and so you mentioned that you had two talks at this conference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> two talks. So what? I mean. Which, which one are you most excited to give? So I did one today, which is done. Um, it was fine, but I'm really excited <laughs> for the one on Wednesday, which is um, a project I'm going to be talking about where we built an escape room in our pseudo simulation space and oh, then ran awesome. like 60 healthcare teams through it. So um, that's, a, that's an exciting one. It sounded. I just did an escape room for the first really? time last week, actually. How would you feel about it? It was terrifying. No, it was <laughs> a scary one. It was actually a scary one. So they didn't do okay. any research before well, they signed us up for yeah. it. But it was amazing how immersive. Yeah. It really was for me. So your whole everything changes. Like yeah. You think, and now that I've built one, you know, my colleague and I um, who built it, we're like gonna go do these rooms and we feel like we're gonna do so well and not be tricked by anything and then Mm -hmm. you're totally rushing and scared and making mistakes because you're just in this immersive environment which is just so crazy and exciting and a great simulation space to study teamwork so absolutely I actually went in with two people I had never met before and by the end of it all of us I mean it was a totally different dynamic so crazy Um, well I am looking forward to that talk I've actually marked that on my schedule so I'll be in the audience I I hope it'll be well received I think I think it will it's it's kind of different from what you typically see at this conference yeah um, but it's It's definitely, we've learned a lot, so that's exciting. And for, you know, the folks that are listening here, you know, who are looking to get more information about human factors or, um, you know, just, just curious about the field. I mean, you looking back, like, what would you have wanted to know, you know, back when you were first kind of getting into it? So if I could give myself any advice, it would be to learn as much as I could about different human factors, methods, and approaches. So especially when you're doing a PhD, you kind of get pigeonholed into a very, very specific area. I, you know, I've done a lot of research on flow disruptions in the operating room and could talk for days about that. But now in my career and in my job, I am trying to broaden my scope. I'm asked to do projects that I've never done before, which is really fun, but I wish I had taken the time in grad school to kind of reach out to different professors in my, you know, we're all in the same hallway. I could have just walked down the hall and said, hey, I'd love to learn more about usability testing or, you know, um, I think if I could give any advice, it'd be to really learn as much as you can about all the different methods, attend the conferences, ask questions, 
try to participate where you can and just have fun learning. So that's fantastic advice. I hope so. <laughs> well, thank you so so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, so, as a listener of the podcast, you probably know that they always end the show with a "It depends." Yep. Yep. So, I'm actually going to ask you to participate in that oh, with yes, me. I'm <laughs> so, on the count of three, we'll do a "It depends." Okay. So, one, two, three. It, it depends. depends.